I'm Jason Reynolds and I'm the Deputy Superintendent for the Peoria Unified School District. There's been a lot of talk over the last few years about school finance and so school districts like ours have put together videos to help our communities better understand how schools are funded and, and where the money goes. They've used all kinds of creative approaches for these videos and as a team we sat down and talked about how we might be able to better capture your attention. We talked about doing animation. Funds in the maintenance and operation bucket pay for the day-to-day -day operation of our schools. Huh? But you're adults, not kids, and the video should appeal to your sensibilities. What about a musical? Five, six, But we're educators, not entertainers. So let's dispense with the entertainment and commence with your school finance education. Let's begin. Arizona schools receive their funding from local property owners, the state of Arizona, and the federal government. Local and state sources provide about 90% of the funding and the remainder comes from the federal government. But unlike your own budget, the use of those funds is restricted by law on how the funds can be spent. Before the district can use the funding, it is split into two separate buckets. Approximately 96% of the funds from local taxpayers and the state are placed into the maintenance and operations bucket, with the remaining 4% going into the capital bucket. The 4% of the budget in the capital bucket pays for durable items that are owned or used by the school for many years, like furniture, buses, textbooks, and technology. Funds in the maintenance and operation bucket pay for the day-to-day -day operation of our schools, including salaries, transportation, utilities, and general supplies like paper. All districts are required to have a balanced budget and cannot spend more than is provided in the two buckets. If the money in either of the two buckets is not enough to meet the needs of our students, the district can ask the local community to pass an override or bond to increase the available funds. Overrides and bonds are different and the funds they generate add to the different buckets. Overrides provide additional funds for the maintenance and operations bucket, and thanks to our community, a 13% override passed in November of 2015, which allowed us to bring back free all-day kindergarten and to provide salary increases for our staff, as well as support invaluable resources, such as assistant principals, nurses, arts education, reading programs, gifted education, athletics, and extracurricular activities. Without the current override, the district's maintenance and operation budget would shrink by more than $27 million. This override will maintain funding for the staff and programs supported by the current override and allow the district to fund new student and staff safety initiatives, such as hiring new counselors and intervention specialists, as well as providing safety-related training to staff and competitive compensation for our teachers. If approved, the override will result in an estimated annual tax rate of $1.74 per $100 of assessed valuation for residential property owners. This represents about a $2 to $6 increase per month over the current override for homeowners in our district. Does school finance make more sense to you now? I hope it does. But if you have more questions about our budget or our override, please visit our website at peoriaunified.org slash bonds and overrides or call us at 623-486-6100.
I'm Jason Reynolds and I'm the Deputy Superintendent for the Peoria Unified School District. There's been a lot of talk over the last few years about school finance and so school districts like ours have put together videos to help our communities better understand how schools are funded and, and where the money goes. They've used all kinds of creative approaches for these videos and as a team we sat down and talked about how we might be able to better capture your attention. We talked about doing animation. Funds in the maintenance and operation bucket pay for the day-to-day -day operation of our schools. Huh? But you're adults, not kids, and the video should appeal to your sensibilities. What about a musical? Five, six, But we're educators, not entertainers. So let's dispense with the entertainment and commence with your school finance education. Let's begin. Arizona schools receive their funding from local property owners, the state of Arizona, and the federal government. Local and state sources provide about 90% of the funding and the remainder comes from the federal government. But unlike your own budget, the use of those funds is restricted by law on how the funds can be spent. Before the district can use the funding, it is split into two separate buckets. Approximately 96% of the funds from local taxpayers and the state are placed into the maintenance and operations bucket, with the remaining 4% going into the capital bucket. The 4% of the budget in the capital bucket pays for durable items that are owned or used by the school for many years, like furniture, buses, textbooks, and technology. Funds in the maintenance and operation bucket pay for the day-to-day -day operation of our schools, including salaries, transportation, utilities, and general supplies like paper. All districts are required to have a balanced budget and cannot spend more than is provided in the two buckets. If the money in either of the two buckets is not enough to meet the needs of our students, the district can ask the local community to pass an override or bond to increase the available funds. Overrides and bonds are different and the funds they generate add to the different buckets. Overrides provide additional funds for the maintenance and operations bucket, and thanks to our community, a 13% override passed in November of 2015, which allowed us to bring back free all-day kindergarten and to provide salary increases for our staff, as well as support invaluable resources, such as assistant principals, nurses, arts education, reading programs, gifted education, athletics, and extracurricular activities. Without the current override, the district's maintenance and operation budget would shrink by more than $27 million. This override will maintain funding for the staff and programs supported by the current override and allow the district to fund new student and staff safety initiatives, such as hiring new counselors and intervention specialists, as well as providing safety-related training to staff and competitive compensation for our teachers. If approved, the override will result in an estimated annual tax rate of $1.74 per $100 of assessed valuation for residential property owners. This represents about a $2 to $6 increase per month over the current override for homeowners in our district. Does school finance make more sense to you now? I hope it does. But if you have more questions about our budget or our override, please visit our website at peoriaunified.org slash bonds and overrides or call us at 623-486-6100.
Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, sorry for the short delay. Um, President Seha Martinez is not going to be able to join us this evening, uh, so I will be running the me meeting, uh, and we'll try to keep it as short as possible. Uh, first item of business is the Pledge of Allegiance and moment of silence. Uh, Ms. Underhill, can you lead us? All right, thank you very much. Next item of business, uh, 3.1, address the agenda and consider adoption or recommended changes. Does anybody need to make any changes? No? Nope. Okay. 4.1 is staff recognitions. Ms. Aries? Do you? This is somebody. Thank you, Mrs. Pengarelli. Um, recognitions, uh, yesterday hundreds of Fourth grade students from six elementary schools attended the Project Wet Water Festival at Alta Vista Park in northern Peoria. And this year's water festival is in partnership with the University of Arizona's Project West, Wet, Wet, and that's what I'm saying? Staff, okay. Um, staff and volunteers from the city of Peoria and Wells Fargo Bank. Also, Tuesday was our fall field trip, and that was. That was pretty exciting. We visited Sunrise Mountain, Frontier, Peoria, and Cactus. And the field trip served as a great opportunity to showcase our schools. And it was, it was just a delightful morning. And uh, really proud of our children. Really proud of our children. Especially can, can say that our, um, our arts program was well received. Um, it, was, it was beautiful. It was a beautiful morning. So thank you. Welcome. All right. Uh, move on to 4.2, board recognitions. Uh, Ms. Underhill. Um, yes, I just wanted to say thank you to all the teachers and uh, school staff, because I know it's parent conference week, so I know that is a busy week, but um, thank you for all the extra hours that you put in, because it's so critical that we talk to our parents and bring them in, and just wanted to give an extra thanks for, for all those extra things that you do for that. Thank you. Mr. Sandoval. Yeah, thank you. You know, I just want to echo what uh, Ms. Pallas Thompson said about the fall uh, field trip this week. It was great, um, you know, being entertained by the uh, the choir there at Sunrise Mountain and all their smiling faces. And uh, I, I'll tell you, I mean, they, they sounded great. So it was uh, it was fantastic. And just enjoyed the community and the city officials and all stakeholders that came together to really just uh, learn more about what we do here in PUSD. So uh, a great turnout. Thank you. Ms. Stone? I don't Okay, then let's move on to 5.1. Request to address the governing board regarding matters not included on the agenda. Uh, any green slips? None. Okay, then let's move on to six. Uh, for the consent agenda, does any board member need to pull any agenda item? No, then I would need a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda as is. I move that we approve the consent agenda. I'll second. All right. Members, please cast your vote. Passes four. Uh, with Mrs. Martinez absent. All right, next agenda item 8.1, discussion and consideration of the 2018-19 annual financial report. Ms. Myers, welcome. Well, good evening. Uh, Mrs. Pingarelli, members of the governing board, Superintendent Pellis Thompson, thank you for the opportunity to provide an overview of the fiscal 2019 annual financial reports for the Peoria Unified School District.
And I'm actually going to have Gary pull it up in a different way, please. We're having a problem with the PowerPoint. Thank you, sir. Tonight's presentation will include an overview of the fiscal 2019 annual financial report, also known as the AFR, as well as related reporting requirements and supplemental reports. I will also highlight this evening maintenance and operations, capital and classroom site fund expenditures and carry forward amounts in addition to expenditure totals for grants and select cash controlled funds. Also included in the presentation is a summary of expenditures by function and website information where our community can view current and past annual financial reports, budgets and audited financial statements. One of our four perspectives of the district strategic plan is stewardship of community resources. Annual financial reporting is part of this, this particular strategic perspective to solidify and adhere to effective policies, practices, and accountability for district resources. The annual financial report includes budget and actual summary information for revenues and expenditures and fund balances for all district funds for the fiscal year. And it is required by Arizona Revised Statute 15904 to be approved by the governing board and submitted to the Arizona Department of Education by October 15th each year. In addition, a separate food service annual financial report, classroom site fund narrative, and school level expenditure report which is new this year, is also part of the agenda item. The reports are compiled in accordance with Arizona Revised Statutes and guidance from the Arizona Auditor General as well as the Arizona Department of Education. The AFR and associated year-end reporting is managed by the Business Services Department. I would like to acknowledge tonight several of our team members who are in the audience and who were instrumental in our year-end close as well as the preparation of our annual financial report. And I'll start with Mrs. Linda Virgil, who's our Director of Accounting, who's in the audience, as well as Lori Rotenberger, who's our Grant and Finance Manager, Michael Vaughn, CPA, who's our Internal Auditor, and Veronica Fabella, our very dedicated Budget Analyst. These team members were critical with our year end and the preparation of the reports that you're seeing tonight. The annual financial report is also reviewed as part of the district's annual financial audit, which is currently underway for fiscal year 2019. Each year in July, Peoria Unified adopts an annual expenditure budget for the fiscal year that includes budget amounts for maintenance and operations expenditures, also referred to as M&O. This fund is where most of the day-to-day -day expenditures take place for the district. M&O expenditures include salaries and benefits, supplies, utilities, transportation costs, as well as contracted purchased services and other expenses that are not capital in nature. This fund is divided into multiple programs. The main programs are regular education, special education, and pupil transportation, as well as a K-3 reading program. For reporting and accounting purposes, each of these programs is further subdivided by function, including instruction, support services, and operations and non-instructional services. The total M&O expenditures cannot exceed the adopted budget limits. In fiscal year 2019, 88% of the M&O expenditures were for employee salaries and benefits, as well as outsourced staffing costs, purchase services. The total expenditures in the M&O fund for the year were $228,562,990. Included in these M&O expenditures is $26.3 million of M&O override funding to support district-wide positions and programs. The district's goal is not to have less than a combined M&O and capital carry forward of less than 3% each year. The reason for for this is Peoria Unified is subject to current year funding and carry forward and fund balance ratios are reviewed both by the Arizona Auditor General as well as our bond rating agencies when we sell bonds. And if a carry forward is, at, is not at a high enough amount, it would indicate that the district is under financial stress. The fiscal 29 M&O carry forward is 3.9% and a portion of this year's M&O carry forward amount will be transferred to capital in fiscal year 2020 for the purchase of reading textbooks. 
The fiscal year 2019 annual financial report is a review of the most recent fiscal year, and it is a financial representation of district-wide activities and teachers and staff supporting student learning throughout the district. The Peoria Unified School District is the largest employer in the city of Peoria and the fourth largest public school district in the state of Arizona. Fiscal year 2019 maintenance and operations expenditures supported educating more than 37,000 preschool through 12th grade students at 41 schools. The district employed 3,900 employees during the year, including 2,095 teachers and certified staff and approximately 1,700 classified staff representing bus drivers, food service workers, nurses, warehouse workers, maintenance, and administrative support staff. Bus drivers transported students over 2.6 million miles, and food service workers served more than 4.6 million meals and snacks to students and staff during the 2018-2019 school year. Capital funds are different than maintenance and operations funds and include district additional assistance, building renewal, adjacent ways, and bond building funds. Unrestricted capital expenditures include furniture, athletic equipment, textbooks, instructional aids, computers, as well as software. Unrestricted capital expenditures in fiscal year 2019 totaled $6.4 million. Building renewal funds consists of monies requested from the school facilities board to maintain the adequacy of existing school facilities. And in fiscal 2019, 313,000 of funding was expended on elementary fire alarm systems and projects. The adjacent ways fund is used to account for special property tax assessments used for constructing and maintaining or improving any public ingress or egress adjacent to land owned by the district. In fiscal year 2019, the district expended $4,320 from this fund. And you may recall from our Meadows land donation, we have set aside 527,000 of fund carry forward from adjacent ways for ingress and egress utilities reimbursement related to the, man, the Meadows rather, land donation. The bond building fund is, a, is used to account for proceeds from the district's bond sales that are expended for school and building renovations, pupil transportation vehicles, technology, and other ca eligible capital expenditures as approved by the voters in our particular bond authorization that was passed in 2012. Fiscal 2019 bond expenditures totaled $14,095,752. The $7,967,148 bond fund carry forward will be added to the last bond sale from the 2012 bond authorization that occurred in July 2019. After this date, there are no additional bond sales remaining in the 2012 bond authorization or new bond funds available to the district. On October 24th, the district will provide the annual bond and maintenance and override update to our community and bonds expenditures will be reviewed in more detail at that meeting. The classroom site fund as prescribed by Arizona Revised Statute 15977 was established in 2002 to account for a portion of the state sales tax collections and state land trust funds provided to school districts as an additional source of funding for teacher salaries and compensation. Classroom site fund expenditures are accounted for in three funds to pay for base and performance pay for certified staff. Total classroom site fund expenditures in fiscal year 2019 totaled $16.4 million. Another category of funds used for operating and capital expenses is special projects. These are federal and state grants which are used for supplemental educational programs including Title I, Title II, IDEA, which is our special education grant, E-rate, and Medicaid in public schools, guidelines for accounting 
and reporting these, for these funds are set forth by the Arizona Department of Education and federal uniform grant guidance. Medicaid in public schools is included in the federal grants total. This fund is used to account for reimbursements and monies received from Medicaid for providing eligible services to students, including speech language, occupational therapy, nursing, and other special education related services. The reimbursements from the Medicaid program can be used for district M&O related expenditures. However, this is not a guaranteed ongoing funding source, and because of that, we do not embed Medicaid funds in salary or staff raises. Federal and state grant expenditures in fiscal 2019 totaled $18.3 million. The federal and state special programs fund to carry forward includes certified and class retention stipends, as well as results-based funding and college credit by exam eligible teacher and staff payments to be made in fiscal year 2020. Also included in the annual financial report are cash controlled funds. And tonight I have a select few on the slide to review with you. A cash controlled fund has budget capacity each year that consists of a beginning fund balance plus revenue that uh, is earned during the year. Auxiliary funds relate primarily to bookstore operations at our high schools and elementary schools and the payment of student fees for classes, parking, field trip, uh, fees, extracurricular, and athletic activities. Auxiliary expenditures in the fund total, totaled $3.1 million for the year. The Civic Center Fund accounts for the rental of school property and buildings to third parties in the evenings and on the weekends. The expenditures in this fund totaled $413,000 for the year. The indirect cost fund is used to account for monies transferred from federal projects, including the food service fund for administrative costs that cannot easily be tracked at a grant specific level. The concept is similar to an overhead amount that is charged with an indirect cost rate approved by the Arizona Department of Education. Attached to this agenda item is the food service annual financial report. Then indirect cost in this fund was $1,446,000 $51. The food service beginning fund balance and revenues were $15.3 million and expenses were just over $14 million, including the allowable indirect cost amount. And lastly, the tax credit fund is used to account for revenues and expenditures of monies collected in support of extracurricular and character education activities, standard, standardized rather test fees, prep classes, and CTE assessments. Contributions to this fund may be taken as a tax credit by the taxpayer in accordance with Arizona Revised Statute 431089.1, and amounts in this fund should be spent on activities for which they are collected. During fiscal year 2019, $1.5 million in tax credit revenue was collected with $1.2 million in associated expenditures occurring in the fund. Arizona public school districts are required to use a consistent chart of accounts detailed in the Uniform System of Financial Records. And the reason for that is that consistent chart of accounts allows school districts to be compared side by side to make an apples to apples comparison when it comes to expenditures based on the account codes that the districts use. This publication is a joint responsibility of the Arizona Auditor General and Arizona Department of Education. This document interprets Arizona Title 15, those are the Arizona Revised Statutes that specifically rate to, relate to public school districts and contain guidelines and requirements that Arizona schools must financially comply with and governs how funds can be used and activity accounting for in, a, in the district's accounting system. The function, which is part of the account code, describes the activity for which the service or the product or material is acquired. Over the last four years, classroom instruction related to expenses in the maintenance and operations capital and classroom site funds has been consistent related to instruction, administration, plant, and transportation costs, with 72% of the fiscal year 2019 expenditures being made for instruction and instruction-related activities, 
16% for central plant and student transportation and food service, and approximately 11% of expenditures being made for administrative activities district-wide. And each year, our uh, dollars in the classroom report is published by the Auditor General's office that also provides similar information as what I've shared this evening, which is from our annual financial report. Peoria Unified has published the district's budget, annual financial reports, and audited financial statements on the district's website going all the way back to 2010 through 2020 at this point. And that information is available for our community to access and review at any time. This concludes the annual financial report presentation. I'm available to answer your questions. All right. Uh, Mr. Sandoval? Ms. Meyer, thank you. Linda, Lori, Michael, Veronica, thank you all uh, for this uh, and certainly your diligence to every day, um, you know, ensuring that we are very uh, good stewards of our community resources. Can you go back to the expense uh, report? I think it's one more. Perfect. So when you take a look at the central service line, can you talk about that column a little bit? Because when I look at that, it looks like, um, you know, we went down up at, well, you know, we're up over 2016. You know, by about you know 0.3 percent, if you will. Just wanted to discuss that a little bit. In 2016, it was a 3.35 percent um, expense. Now it's at a 3.67. Am I reading that correctly? Yes, and in each year there is modest movement between the functions and expenditures. And an example. Of, of one of the reasons why there was that change. Uh, in this particular fiscal year, we paid for district-wide armored car services and credit card fees out of m and instead of indirect costs. So typically, as part of our audit, we do have to go through and at a granular level explain differences and changes, and sometimes there might be an increase in fees um, or additional purchases of resources or computer programs, as an example. So we always do go through by function and explain the changes that have occurred. And also, we, we've implemented some pay increases th this year for staff. And those increases are reflected in each category as well because we have staff uh, who are coded to all of the functions. Gotcha. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Ms. Stone? I don't really have any questions. Thank you very much. Ms. Underhill? Um, yeah, I just had a couple questions. On the slide um, that talks about the classroom site fund, um, I was just curious, and this may just be the reclassification that we discussed the last time, but the performance pay fund, you know, we obviously expended less than we budgeted, so we've got that money, but can you explain that? Because, you know, obviously we want to hopefully, you know, compensate our teachers with whatever we can as long as we're meeting those, you know, criteria that are set forth. But I just was curious about that. Absolutely, and actually at our last board meeting there was a consent agenda item that addressed paying uh, some of the performance pay eligible certified staff uh, who were not in the classroom coded to function 1000 from m &O. So they were paid, they were eligible, but we uh, made the decision in 2019 to pay for those individuals out of m &O versus the classroom site fund. That carry forward will be available for eligible certified staff, teachers for base pay and performance pay. Each year we do have a carry forward and that becomes part of the next year's compensation package. So there was no change in what a team member or staff member received. We, we just moved a portion of that to m and that was actually ratified at our last board meeting. Great. That's awesome. That's kind of what I figured. Um, another question I had is um, on the cash controlled accounts, do they just, they just move forward as well? Is that correct? They do. They do carry forward. So um, the difference between a cash-controlled fund and a levy fund, as I mentioned, that maintenance and operations and capital amount, that's a set budget limit. However, cash-controlled funds, budget capacity is based on the fund balance plus the revenue that is earned in the, in the current year. And then expenditures are taken out and the remaining amount can carry forward. So the majority of our cash-controlled funds have the ability to carry forward. There are, there are some uh, guiding statutes in certain funds that offer an expectation that um, monies that are received would be expended in the current year, but there's still the ability to carry forward a fund balance. And so that's what you see on the page that summarizes our cash-controlled accounts. 
Great, thank you. And then I just had, I think just one more question. <laughs> um, as far as the, you know, we've got the attachment on the school base, the school level reporting, um, and this is just more of a general question, but um, there's, you know, sort of like four main categories across that. Is there flexibility for schools within those categories? So, for example, if a school wanted to put additional dollars into staff salaries for, and they had some funding in professional development, is that a possibility or, or just in general, how does that work? That's a very good question. So we do have a staffing standard and a model that we follow each year. Um, there are board approved stipends and any change with compensation has to go through our policy driven process. So when there's a budget amount that's determined either as part of a grant or from an operations perspective, it's usually aligned with that particular line item in the budget. A good example would be if there's budget allocated for supplies mm -hmm the expectation is it will be spent on supplies. However, at a site level or department level, there are um, sometimes decisions that are made to pay, for instance, um, for overtime out of that, that department or school's site-based budget. So there's flexibility with that. And I'm glad you actually asked about the school level reporting because that is our first requirement related to ESSA. Every uh, Student Succeeds Act, and you've heard us talk about that a little bit when we had our Title I presentation back in February, and the federal requirements that will apply to all states and all school districts related to providing more detailed and granular reporting that school level and per pupil. And so what you're seeing with this additional report is Arizona-wide school districts being required to start to report at a school level the expenditures. And so we have met that requirement. And then ADE at, a, at an agency level will provide district-based report cards to uh, basically finish meeting that requirement for this particular year. Next year, you're going to see even more detail as we continue to manage these requirements. These requirements are actually um, uh, impacting our staff district-wide because now when we do a requisition, we have to provide more detail at a unit or school level. You, we're not able to continue to, on occasion, charge something district-wide. You have to spend the time to break it out. So that way, when we do that year-end reporting, we're able to truly identify the school level expenditures accurately. Um, and other than that, I just want to say I think you guys have done an amazing job. It's it's really nice to see that our actual expenditures are below our budget, you know, budgeted um, expense in in every category. And I know things have fluctuated in different accounts and that kind of thing. But that's I mean that's fantastic. So thank you for doing such a jo you know good job and being such a good steward of of all of our resources. Thank you. It is a, a team effort. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ms. Myers, for your presentation. I also wanted to. Uh, to thank your, your staff. I know with all the staffing changes, it has been extremely challenging, and I appreciate uh, everybody's hard work. So thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Now with that, I would need a motion and a second. I move that we approve the financial report for fiscal year 2018 to 2019. Second. Thank you. All right, we have a first and a second. Uh, members, please vote. All right, passes four with one absent. Thank you very much. All right, next item is 8.2, or excuse me, 8 point, yeah, it is 8.2. First read of policy section BEDF, uh, Dr. Reynolds. Good evening, Mrs. Pingarelli, members of the governing board, Superintendent Pallas Thompson, cabinet and guests. Tonight we bring for your consideration changes to six of our policies. Uh, as a reminder, multiple times a year, the Arizona School Board Association sends us advisories to change policy, and after review by cabinet and other leaders impacted by these changes, we bring them to you for your consideration. So our first policy this evening is policy BEDH, public participation at board meetings. 
The removal of the language in this policy is to avoid any misconception that we allow content restrictions on speech during public participation. It does not change our expectation of civility during our meetings, and we do recommend the change. All right. Any comments, questions, Ms. Doan? Hmm. I guess not. Oh, I did. Mr. Sandoval? No, sorry. I always get you in the wrong. <laughs> Ms. Underhill? No, I'm good. Okay. Thank you. I don't have any either. Me. All right. It's a little nitpicky, but. Next item is first read, as 8.3, first read of policy section JICA. So as you stated, we have uh, policy JICA student dress. Uh, the reason for these changes is to provide greater clarity of expectations. The policy has been updated to use language that promotes positive behaviors. It also adds language that discourages clothing, clothing that promotes discrimination and makes clear that students may wear clothing displaying religious messages to the extent that all other clothing and messages are allowed. We also recommend the change. Could you say that again, please? The... the the last part where it says that students may wear clothing displaying religious messages to the extent that all other clothing uh, with messages are allowed. Okay. There are, there are not different expectations uh, for clothing that might display religious messages than any other clothing that has messages on it. That's very strange that we have to point that out. <laughs> well, there have been, yes. Yeah. Situations where that is necessary. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Sandoval. Yeah. So, so my only question is this: um, you know, when you take a look at you know student handbooks, you know, across the district, it's my assumption is as we take a look at this policy. I mean, how does it cascade down, you know, to the sites? Um, and, and does it? I'm assuming it does. But can you just talk about that process, if you don't mind? Right, so there's different, different processes depending on uh, different districts. So one of the conversations that we've been having is uh, the next steps would then be to look at the regulations that come with this uh, because from the, the policy then will come a regulation uh, that we will uh, inform the board of in a, a Friday report. And then we work directly with schools uh, to make sure that any differences between um, nuances between schools and their policies match what the governing board's policy and the regulation. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Andrea? All right. Go ahead. Um, I don't know if we... I've, I've heard occasionally from some students that, you know, there's concerns about dress code, et cetera. Is that something that our student advisory committee has, like, talked about or brought up? I'm just curious about the student voice within this particular area so playing the new card again I can't speak necessarily to what's uh, been talked about in the past uh, however that would be a great uh, example of using our, our student groups to gain feedback on uh, individual school school policies as well as the policies in our handbook It'd be a great idea yeah can, sorry Beth um, can, can we um, capture an understanding on when the last time was that we looked at our student handbooks you know has it been two years ago has it been 20 years ago um, so mr. Sandoval it's my understanding that we review our our um, k-8 handbook our elementary handbook and our high school handbook yearly annually okay and that usually that takes place in the spring gotcha okay thank you I don't have any further questions. Then we'll move on to 8.4, uh, first read of policy section JIH. So, uh, Mrs. Pingarelli, Governing Board, uh, this policy uh, refers to student uh, interrogation, searches, and arrests. Uh, in the past session, there was legislation that now requires schools to inform parents when a child is involved in a serious crime and makes uh, the parents of that child aware of the situation. Uh, this is in line with best practice and the law, and we do recommend the change. Any comments, Ms. Doan? Mr. Sandoval? No, Ms. Underhill? I figure we've already been doing that. I guess we're good with that one. 
We move on to 8.5, first read of policy section JLCD. This policy refers to medicines and administering medicines uh, to students. Again, these modifications are being recommended to match new legislation uh, that both requires parental consent to administer medi uh, medication, except in the cases of emergency, and it also makes employees Im immune from civil li liability for the consequences of a good faith implementation of this policy. And we do recommend All right. the change. Ms. Underhill? Ms. Stone? Mm -mm. Mr. Sandoval? Okay, I guess we're good with that one also. Let's move on to 8.6, first read of policy section JLDAC. So this is our fifth recommendation of the evening, and this uh, involves screening and testing of students. This is a new policy created by Senate Bill 1456. It is now statutorily required to provide vision screening for our students. We have been providing this service to our students for quite some time, and we do recommend the new language. Any comments or concerns from the board? No, I guess we're good with that one. Uh, move on to 8.7, first read of policy section JLF. So this policy is regarding reporting child abuse and child protection. Uh, again, House Bill 2008 revised current legislation that clarifies that if a supervisor reasonably believes that a child abuse report has been made by the person required to make it, then the supervisor is not required to make the report. This is clarifying language uh, to avoid multiple reportings, uh, and we do recommend the changes. Okay. Any comments, questions from the board? Nope. And I guess we are good with um, 8.7 also. Thank, Thank you. you very much. All right, let's move on to 9.1, budget facilities planning and construction reports. And this can be found online. All right, 9.2, enrollment reports. This one also can be found online. Uh, next, 9.3, report on upcoming meeting and events. And Ms. Airy, do you have anything you want to highlight? No. Okay. Then let's move on to 9.4, legislative updates. And Ms. Myers? Well, good evening again, Mrs. Pingarelli, members of the board, Superintendent Palace Thompson. On Monday, October 7th, Senator Martha McSally visited Peoria High School and was given a tour of the campus by student leaders. During the visit, Senator McSally also shared her experiences as the first American female Air Force fighter pilot with Peoria High School students and demonstrated how components of her Air Force flight suit worked from a STEM perspective as well as answered questions from the students. And speaking of STEM and technology, a recent report released by the Arizona Technology Council shows that the state's technology industry is growing 40% faster than the country overall. Since January of this year, Arizona has added 2,600 jobs in the technology industry. The industry has also seen a wage growth of 5.1% and has an average annual salary of over $80,000 a year. In total, the state of Arizona supports over 240,000 tech jobs at more than 9,000 800 technology-based companies and establishments. Thank you very much. Let's move on then to 10.1, board, mem board member opportunity to readdress agenda items. Does anybody want to change anything? Mr. No. Sandoval, you have that look. Is there a... I do, and really? I just want to... Really? This is a first. I still have a question, uh, one more question about the GICA, the address code. Then we will go back to... Um, 8.3. 8.3, thank you. So the question is really around, um, stemming from what Ms. Underhill stated earlier, just when we take a look at annually, take a look at our student handbooks, what uh, voices, what individuals from you know the different verticals throughout the district actually take a look at that handbook to help inform what it may look like in the subsequent year? 
So thank you very much for your question, uh, Mr. Sandoval. Um, interesting enough, that is a conversation that we just started having uh, this week in, in looking at who is involved in that process. Currently, uh, there are uh, administrators and staff involved in that, uh, but um, absent from that, that process are student voice and potentially parent voice. And so I think those are important things to look at as we enter that spring process. Perfect. No, thank you for that. So moving forward, you will include those uh, the parents and students in addition to others that may have not been included in the past? Absolutely. That makes sense. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, sure. Uh, let's move on to 10.2 which is draft agenda for the October 24th, 2019 governing board meeting. I'm sure there will be other things added to it. Thank you very much. 10.3, request for agenda items for future governing board meetings. Ms. Underhill? Mr. Sandoval? Ms. Stone? I don't have anything either. All right. I think this is going to be a record, then uh, <laughs> I told you. Uh, then item 11, adjournment. I would need a motion and a second for anybody that wants to go home. I move that we adjourn. Thank you. Second. Oh, I guess I better vote. Are we doing a voice vote or are we, are we voting? Are we? Okay, and I'm sure this will be, oh, do you need a voice vote to make sure? Okay, I'm sure it passes four with one absent. Well, thank you very much everybody for coming. Mrs. Uh, President Seha Martinez will be back next board meeting. Thank you.